All right, uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce Alan Downey. Um, Alan is a professor of computer science at Olin College. Uh, and a lot of us, uh, he's also the author of, uh, of at least three books for O'Reilly, Think Python, Think Stats, and Think Complexity, looking at uh, an intersecting world of ideas around uh, using uh, software to explore other concepts. Uh, and uh, he's a professor at Olin College of Computer Science. A lot of us here at Google know him from his stint as a visiting science, scientist in uh, Jason Glasgow's group under Leonidas. Uh, and uh, just a quick personal anecdote, I took this book home on Tuesday. By Wednesday afternoon, there was already an iterated Prisoner's Dilemma tournament going on in my house when I got home. So uh, it's dangerous, but thank you very much, Alan. Thank you, David. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a lot of fun for me to be back. Uh, I was just pointing out the, the part in the book that's about, about you. Um, so enjoy that. Uh, if you want to follow along, that's the URL for the slides I'm using. There are a few links in the slides. So if you um, go to that, you'll be able to follow those links. Uh, so as David mentioned, I'm going to be talking about this book, Think Complexity. I want to start out by telling you a little bit about the history of how this book came around. I teach at Olin College, which is a small engineering college in Needham. It's relatively new. It's only been operating for about 10 years. The mission of the college is to create an innovative engineering program. And specifically for computer science, we needed to create a curriculum that made sense for engineers. We don't offer a degree in computer science. We offer degrees in engineering. Students can con concentrate in computer science, which is kind of like doing a minor, but we didn't want to just do an engineering major with a CS minor. We thought there was an opportunity to do something richer than that. So what we weren't looking for is a department of computer science. What we ended up doing is taking the ideas in computer science, took the whole curriculum, and you can imagine if each class is a box full of stuff, we just took all the stuff and dumped it all out on the table, threw away the boxes, and started rearranging the stuff. Because a lot of the groupings of ideas are historical and might not be the best choices for a current curriculum. So for example, if you have the luxury of offering lots of classes, you'll have an operating systems class and a networks class and a databases class. And there might not be explicit connections between those. But if you now take all those pieces and dump them on the table and think, I'm going to teach one class that covers those three topics, well, you lose something because you're not going to be able to cover everything that you did before. But you gain something because if you take operating systems and networks together, you're naturally talking about distributed systems. If you take file systems and databases together, you're naturally looking at a file system as a kind of database or a database as a kind of file system. And I think there are ideas that come out of that. So we wrote about it. We called it the small footprint curriculum in computer science. The one problem that we found ourselves with is that there was no natural place to teach data structures. Now, this is a picture of my PhD advisor, Paul Hilfinger, who's been teaching data structures at Berkeley uh, for quite a long time. And I think he would be disappointed looking at my curriculum to see that we weren't doing justice to data structures. The problem that we ran into is that most of the way data structures gets taught is out of its context, kind of one data structure after another. Lots of pros and cons of this implementation versus that implementation, but mostly unmotivated. So that was stuck in my head of, OK, how are we going to get data structures back into the curriculum? At the same time, historically, we had complexity science happening. Um, and it's a little bit hard to characterize exactly what was happening and when. This is a timeline from the Wikipedia page on complexity science that gives the timing of some of the major events. Um, the thing about this that was exciting to me is that it's all relatively new. You can study a whole lot of math and science at the undergraduate level before you get past, say, the 19th century. There's very little 20th century math and science that you get to until you get to grad school. But I thought there was an opportunity there because complexity science, in addition to being new, is also very accessible. Uh, and I'll talk in a minute about ways that it's accessible. One of them is that there were lots of popular nonfiction books written about complexity. So I started building a class around that. 
This was version one of the class was in 2005. And I started by just grabbing all the books about this stuff and trying to figure out if we could find out what's there. You know, there's a certain amount of hype. Is there some substance behind it? And the other thing that I wanted to do was start with, start with the popular nonfiction, which usually doesn't have the technical details in it. There's no code. There's very little mathematics. But what you can do in the context of a class is start with that and then dive in deeper. So we found a number of the papers, the original papers on these topics. Students re-implemented a lot of the models that were described in those papers. So that was the first version of the class. And at the end of the class, I tried to summarize the whole thing with what I called the ultra secret point of the class. Because for the whole semester, we didn't really know yet what the class was about. I kind of did the same thing the second time around. I felt like I was playing hide the football with the class for the whole semester because I, I hadn't in my own head got to the point where I could explain a coherent big picture of what it was about. So we, I think we were having a good time. We learned some more Python. We got some more data structures. We found ourselves talking about philosophy of science quite a lot because the models that were coming up in, in complexity science raised a lot of questions about what exactly are we doing with these models? What kind of science is this? So that was the second iteration of the class. The third iteration was just this past fall. And I got to do a couple of things. Um, one of them is I wrote this book. I had drafted parts of it, but I finally sat down and wrote everything except chapter one. We used that for the class. And what the students did over the course of the semester was uh, a set of case studies where they worked in teams of three or four, and each of them would choose a topic that could have been a chapter in the book but wasn't. And they wrote the missing chapters of the book in the form of these case studies. And some of them are now included in the book that you've got. Um, so this, I thought, was a nice opportunity to give the students a chance to do some authentic work that was going to get published. In fact, I recruited a program committee to get other members of the faculty to do my grading for me. So the students turned in their case studies. I pretended I was the program chair and sent out all the papers. The other faculty wrote reviews. We decided which ones would be included, which ones weren't quite ready. Um, and then I edited in January and sent it to the publisher. And uh, O'Reilly, I think, does a really nice job of turning books around quickly. I turned in the manuscript in January, and I think it was available in March. Uh, which, if you've worked with other publishers, that's pretty remarkable. And I finally, in January, sat down and wrote what I think is the ultra-secret point of the book, which is the ultra-secret point of the class. And I will now tell you what it is, which is, I think, the development of complexity science has caused a quiet revolution in science. And what I mean by that is, first, what kinds of activities do we mean when we say science? What do we think is a good theory? If you propose an explanation for something, what's a satisfying explanation? And maybe hand in hand with that, what's a, what's a good model of a physical system? I'm going to talk about some of the axes that I think we're moving along. And I don't mean to say that this is black and white, that it used to be 100% this, and now it's 100% that but that I think the center of mass of scientific activity is gradually shifting from, from your point of view, left to right on each of these axes. From models of physical systems that tend to be in the form of equations toward things that tend to be in the form of simulation, away from mathematical analysis like symbolic computation and toward discrete computation, continuous mathematics toward discrete mathematics, linear models, linear systems, toward nonlinear models. Uh, I'll give an example of some of these in a minute. I don't want to go too much into details, but I'll, t I'll talk about it more in the book. Deterministic to stochastic. Um, I'll also mention abstract and detailed. In the context of modeling, what I mean by that is a detailed model is a realistic description of a physical system, where I can look at the physical system and the elements of my model, and there are clear analogs between them. I can match them up one to one, and I can say, yep, that's a realistic description of the system. And when I say abstract, I mean mostly the opposite of that. It's a more abstracted, it's a more um, less detailed description, less realistic. Some of the other axes, if you are doing analysis, if you're doing mathematical 
computation, you tend to have to limit yourself to simple systems that have a small number of components, and those components are usually identical. With computational models, you can often move toward large numbers of components that can be different, heterogeneous. OK, that was pretty abstract. Let me give a more concrete example. So celestial mechanics might be the, the canonical example of classical science, which I'll just I'll use the term classical science just to contrast it with whatever the new thing is, maybe complexity science. So the question is, so why are planetary orbits elliptical? It's a natural kind of question to ask. We'd like an explanation of that behavior. It turns out if you know the law of universal gravitation, you can write down a set of differential equations that describes the motions of planets, at least for a simplified solar model, solar system model. And if you now solve those differential equations, you get ellipses, and you've explained why those orbits are ellipses. And I think there's something very satisfying about that kind of explanation. I think at least most people find it satisfying. I want to offer as a point of comparison, this is uh, Thomas Schelling's model of racial segregation. And it was similarly, it's motivated by a why question. If you look at a lot of cities, people are segregated by race. So you might ask why. What he proposed is a model where the people in your city have two kinds, in this case, red and green, and they all live on a two-dimensional grid so that each of them has eight neighbors. And the model of their behavior is that they are happy if at least a few of their neighbors are like themselves. So if two or three out of the eight are the same color, they're happy and they stay put. If they have fewer neighbors like themselves, they start to feel unhappy and they move, and moving in this case just means picking a random unoccupied uh, cell in the grid and moving to it. Okay? So you could characterize the agents in this model as being mildly xenophobic. They don't like to be completely surrounded by people who are not like themselves. But you probably wouldn't describe them as rabid racists. Nevertheless, the outcome of the system tends to look like what's happening on the right there, where things get almost completely segregated by color in this case. And in fact, this is an intermediate step in the process. If you keep running that, it almost just becomes two great big blobs with one boundary between them, depending on the parameters that you tweak in the system. Uh, the red and green, anybody colorblind? Oh, all right. So I just I, I thought it was funny that who, the people who made that particular uh, graph made it as unaccessible as possible. So the question is, do you find the Newtonian explanation of elliptical orbits more satisfying than the Schelling explanation of racial segregation? I think most people do, but I want to poke a little bit at why. There are a few characteristics of classical science that make us feel good about it, but it's not obvious that we are justified in feeling good. So one of them is the appeal to a universal law. In that case, we were able to invoke universal gravitation. And I think there's something about the fact that the same law applies to things moving on the Earth's surface and also to planets moving in solar systems that makes us feel like that law has validity as opposed, for example, to a law that has very narrow scope. Okay. There's a certain amount of mathematical virtuosity that I think impresses us and makes the work seem more real. I have a colleague in physics who frequently refers to the sort of thing I do as playing with computers. So mathematics is real, playing with computers is fun and games. Um, on the other hand, so I'm, I'm, I don't want to bias this too much. I think that one might have been a little edgy. But legitimately, predictive power is, I think, something we would like to see in a model or a theory. And that was in the great selling point of Newton's explanation of celestial mechanics. We can predict solar eclipses. We can predict all sorts of things that are going to happen. That's not as true of Schelling's model. Uh, and, and proofiness. It feels like we've just done a mathematical proof. Now, I would say it's not a proof. We can't prove anything about actual physical systems. We can prove things about mathematical abstractions. And we might hope 
that the proof about the mathematical abstraction is analogous to something in the real world, but that part's just a hope. Um, on the flip side, so thinking about Schelling's model, the obvious characteristic of Schelling's model is that you've just described human beings by a set of rules that says, I'm going to count the number of my neighbors and be happy or unhappy depending on that count. Most sociologists would not be happy about the reduction that you just made of human behavior. The other, as I mentioned, is that you're just playing with computers. And the last is, if models like this can't make detailed predictions that allow us to validate whether the model is correct or not, then what kind of work can they do? So this is the framework that I use when I teach the class, and it appears in the book as well. I think this is a general model of a lot of what we do when we model the world, which describes scientific activity, but I would also argue it, it describes how we think. Most of our thinking about the world is in form of models like this where we have some physical system that we can observe. We have either direct or indirect sensory data. We then construct a model sometimes implicitly, sometimes explicitly, that is an abstraction of the real thing, meaning that we've left out details. The nice thing about the model, though, is that unlike the real world, we can write proofs in models. We can do analysis of models. We can run simulations of models. What you get out of that are predictions and explanations that you can then compare to whatever it was that you saw in the physical system and get some kind of uh, validation out of that. Um, so this is, this is the framework, at least that I propose to my students. And then we can ask, so what kind of work does Schelling's model do? It's not a proof. It has very little predictive power. I can't tell you, I can't use Schelling's model to tell you how segregated Boston will be in the future. But what it does provide is a kind of a logical argument. It's an existence proof or a counterexample to the assumption that if you see segregation in a city, that the people who live there must be racists. That the, on that the only explanation of segregation is racist agents. So the claim I think that Schelling would make is that this might be sufficient to cause segregation. But it's not necessary. You don't have to actually have people behaving like this in order to see segregation as the outcome. And what that means is that that segregation, the fact that the city seems to be racist, could be an emergent property, meaning that the system as a whole has that property, but the components do not. The, the individual agents might not be racist. I want to give one other example of this kind of model because I think a couple of examples will help us think about it. Uh, I'm going to talk about the six degrees experiment that Stanley Milgram ran. How many people are familiar with Stanley Milgram? Okay. If you're not, I highly encourage you to find out more about him. I think he's fascinating in part because he ran two out of the three most infamous experiments in all of social science. One of them that I just think you have to read about if you haven't is his study of obedience to authority. This is the one of the original deceptive uh, social behavior experiments where he brought people in and told them that they were participating in a teaching and learning experiment where they would act as a teacher. And a learner on the other side of the glass was actually an actor. And the subjects were told to administer electric shocks whenever the learner got the answer wrong. And they would start out by giving a 15 volt shock and work their way up a board to 450 volts. And what would happen as you went from 15 to 450, two things would happen. One, the warning labels on the board would say things like, you know, mild shock, severe shock, hazard, warning, danger. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was increasingly dramatic. You know, yellow and black diagonal stripes, everything. Also, the actor on the other side of the glass would go from saying things like, ow, or hey, stop that, to I'm having a heart attack, please stop, to silence <laughs> at one point. The nature of the experiment was to see how far up the board 
people would be willing to go under different circumstances. And some of the circumstances, for example, would be the investigator in a lab coat, also an actor, standing behind the subject and saying things like, you must continue. The experiment requires you to continue. Um, and you probably see where the punchline of this is going, which is that many people go much farther up the board than you would like to believe about human nature. In fact, something like six, under some conditions, and I forget the exact details, something like 60% of the subjects went all the way to 450 volts yeah. and, and were asking for more. Um, so I, I think it was when the authority assumed said, stated that they were assuming all responsibility. I think, yeah, you're right. And there were different scripts and different layouts of whether they could see the authority or whether they could see the learner and so on. So, Fascinating stuff, especially because no one will ever be allowed to run that experiment again. <laughs> Institutional review boards were pretty much created. They should be called the Stanley Milgram Memorial Institutional <laughs> Review Boards. Um, anyway, fascinating stuff. Read more about it if you're not already familiar with it. The other experiment that he did, that is the one I'm going to talk a little bit about today, is the small world experiment, where he wanted to investigate the structure of social networks by seeing whether he could get a package delivered across the country following only social hops. So I think he st they started in Wichita, Kansas, and they had a couple of different targets. One of them was a stockbroker in Sharon, Massachusetts. My father was a stockbroker in Sharon, Massachusetts, but not the target of the, <laughs> of the Milgram experiment. The idea was that um, Milgram or one of his, his um, Associates would give a package to someone and say, I want you to, del to deliver this to this person. And they would be given the name, occupation, and where they lived. But the rules are you can only give this to someone that you know personally. So if you know the target personally, you can just go give it to them and you're done. And otherwise, you have to give it to someone that you know personally. What he wanted to know was how many hops it would take to get from Wichita to Sharon, Massachusetts. Uh, and this graph shows the distribution of hops for the packages that were delivered. Now, not all the packages were delivered, so there's a bias behind this, and that's been the subject of a lot of discussion. But the interesting thing about this is that the mode is at six. It took six hops, most often, to get from source to destination, and that's where the six degrees of separation term comes from. Okay. So at the time, very little was known about the structure of social networks. Since then, it's been the subject of a lot of study. And we have several good explanations of why the diameter of these social graphs seems to be so much shorter than you would expect. So that's the good thing is that we have lots of explanations. The bad thing is that we have too many explanations, and they're incompatible. So there are uh, two, two models that people have proposed as simplified topologies that capture important elements of social networks. Watts and Strogatz have what they call a small world graph, which is a parameterized graph between a completely regular graph on one end and a completely random graph on the other. And what they find is a sweet spot in the middle that behaves like social networks in the sense that it is highly clustered meaning that your friends tend to know each other, but also has a small diameter, meaning that it has this small world behavior. So that's one possible explanation. The other is Barabasi and Albert's model, which is a scale-free network. The way you build one of these is by growing it. So if you start out with one or a small number of nodes and gradually add nodes with the property of preferential attachment, meaning the rich get richer and the poor don't grow as fast, what you get is a high, um, a long tail distribution of uh, degree in the network. There are, most people have a small number of friends, but there are a few people who have a very large number of friends. That graph also has the small world property. And so now, if you're trying to explain the small world property, you don't know which explanation is right. This is. Part of the reason in my class that I found myself inevitably talking about philosophy of science, because we just left the world of doing science, building models and using them to predict, explain, and design. What we're now talking about is theory choice. Why should I prefer one model or one theory over another? 
And so that led us toward uh, Thomas Kuhn, who wrote The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which is probably his most famous book. If you're not familiar with that book in particular, you're almost certainly familiar with paradigm shifts. That book introduced that term. So all the bad jokes about paradigm shifts that we've had for the last, let's see, since 1963 or four, uh, you can blame Thomas Kuhn for that particular piece of vocabulary. He also wrote an essay called Objectivity, Value Judgment, and Theory Choice, which is explicitly about the, the situation we were just talking about. Two competing models. In some sense, they both explain the data. So you can't choose one over the other purely in terms of how well it fits data. There have to be other criteria, and that's exactly what he explained. Well, what are those other criteria? Both descriptively, like if we watch scientists and listen to what they say, what are the criteria that they seem to be applying? And also normatively, which is which of those criteria do we think are justified and, and which might be biased? One of the reasons that the class inevitably ends up in philosophy was explained nicely by XKCD which found that the structure of information, at least as represented by the Wikipedia, has a tendency to lead inevitably to philosophy. And this came out by the, the experiment that if you take any article, click on the first link, and repeat that process, you will eventually end up at philosophy. Uh, if you haven't read that cartoon, I, I recommend it to you. Um, so I took some of the things that we were talking about in the class and made them into a running theme throughout the book. So each chapter tends to raise a different issue in philosophy of science. And then I tried to write a little bit about it, just enough to introduce what I thought were interesting questions and hopefully point you to, toward more reading. Uh, I mentioned theory choice as one of the first topics that comes up. The demarcation problem is one of the others. The demarcation problem is, uh, is there a justified definition of science that lets us distinguish between things that are real science, good science, and other things like pseudoscience or that, that seem like they might be sciency, but they're not, or say religion, things that are not science at all, but how do we clearly uh, justify that definition? Realism and instrumentalism comes up quite a lot. This, is, um, this pertains to how we interpret the theories and models that we're using to describe physical systems. I won't say too much about that now. I'm going to come back to it just a little bit later. Uh, holism and reductionism is one of the other uh, topics that comes up. Again, I won't say too much about that right now. But I will come back to, as I said, the ultra secret point of this book. I started with this set of axes uh, at the beginning, and I speculate, or at least the, my thesis, is that we are living through a transition toward a new kind of science. I'm kind of borrowing that phrase from Stephen Wolfram, but I mean it in a different sense that he does. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to violate his trademark on that phrase. He is primarily talking about, um, well, actually tell you what, if, if you want to know what I think Wolfram is saying when he says new kind of science, ask me afterwards. Let me not go down that. What I mean by it is just what I was saying before, the shift along these axes in what we think is science, what we think is a good model, what we think is a satisfying kind of explanation, what we think is good work for a scientist to do. I think there are some other shifts going on at the same time that are related. One of them is what kind of work do we want models to do? With the Newton example and the Schelling example, I wanted to show what I think is a shift from models that are primarily meant to be predictive. They were often tools that we would use as computational devices for making predictions that had practical consequences. I think there's a shift toward models that may be explanatory without necessarily having predictive property. I mentioned realism and instrumentalism. All right, let me finally say what I mean by that. Let me throw out an idea. Are electrons real by a common language use of the word real? Okay. So I think we would all buy, or at least I'll ask you to accept, that chair is real. Okay. Unicorns are not real. So on, on that axis of real, not real, <laughs> what's your feeling about electrons? 
Not real? Okay. They might be a purely useful abstraction. And you can certainly take that view. That would be an instrumentalist interpretation of a theory involving electrons. Uh, now here's a trivial thing that you could do with that theory. Electrons, for historical reasons, have negative charge. You could imagine a whole new physics of the world where you just flip the signs of everything. Okay, that, that new physics would be just as good as the old physics, except that electrons in some sense would be different. They would have positive charge. And it's clear that you haven't done any work by doing that transition, but it does suggest that the entities that make up your model are in some sense arbitrary. I could have the had... The charge is, um, is, is arbitrary. Yeah. So, the number is arbitrary. Right. Yeah. yeah, so in that case I haven't really done much, but I could imagine another physics that, that postulated a different set of entities, more different than just positive versus negative charge, and that other physics might be just as good as, as what we currently call physics. It's not easy to actually make one up as a good example, but it's at least imaginable. Anyway, that discussion will take you down the road toward talking about realism and instrumentalism. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one is uh, reductionism and holism. I'm torn about how far to get into that one. Hofstadter talks about this in uh, Gödel, Escher, and Bach, and this is one of his, his figures that I kind of like just because it's a nice way to think about things that you would interpret differently at different scales. Um, and that's related to reductionism and holism. I think I'm going to punt on that for now, but we'll give you a chance to talk about it later if you want to. If there's a new kind of science going on here, one can imagine that there would be a new kind of engineering that goes with it, and I think there is. <coughs> These again are some of the axes where I think we're shifting over time away from engineered systems that tended to be centralized toward decentralized systems. Isolation and interaction, what I mean by that is that in a lot of engineering design, if you want to build something complex that involves many subsystems, you want to be able to design each subsystem in isolation without having to worry about all the others at the same time. In the context of software, this is often described in terms of abstraction and encapsulation, but it's a fundamental idea through all of engineering that if every component of your system depends on every other component, you very quickly won't be able to design anything. It will collapse under the weight of its own complexity. But that's increasingly, I won't say not true, I'll say less true that we now have more tools for dealing with complexity and that allows us to relax a little bit the requirement that everything be very carefully isolated we can design things that have more interacting components now and still be able to manage that. One of the ways of man managing that is to replace classical analysis with computation. You can design more complicated things if you throw more computational power at it. One example of that, does anybody know what that building is? The Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain. Who designed it? Anything around here also designed by Frank yes. Gehry? <laughs> the Stata Center. Is it Stata or Stata? Stata, I think. Okay. The guy's name is Stata. The people who work there call it Stata. Stata yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, so one of the reasons that they were able to build that thing is that they used CAD software that had been developed for designing boats. And Gehry's innovation was to apply it to buildings it would not have been feasible to design or build that prior to the availability of that software. In the same way that it wasn't feasible to design or build the Eiffel Tower prior to Eiffel's development of analytic techniques for, for designing and analyzing those kinds of structures. The other piece of this that I think is interesting is that I think increasingly we will search for engineering solutions rather than design them. Um, and maybe I'll just leave it at that. One more piece of this, so I'm speculating on a new kind of science, a new kind of modeling, a new kind of engineering, and here's a new kind of thinking, which is I think our fascination with Aristotelian logic will gradually fade and be replaced by some kind of multi-valued logic. Um, being kind of a Bayesian myself, I'm biased toward Bayesianism as my favorite multi-valued logic. Um, but that inevitably takes you on the road from imagining that 
your scientific theories are objective or that your beliefs about the world are objective toward acknowledging that they're subjective and if they are, then what? Subjectivity seems like a dangerous slope toward pure relativism. You know, what's true is true for me, what's true for you is true for you, and we can't talk to each other. That, no, that doesn't seem to be the case, and so it raises the question of whether we can have subjectivity without complete collapse. A couple of other shifts that I think are going on away from thinking of scientific theories in terms of universal physical laws, more toward theories and models, I would argue that there's no meaningful difference between a theory and a model, that when you tell me that, you're, that you have a theory, what you're really doing is recommending a model to me. And the language that we'd, we would use for choosing one of those models, again, goes back to uh, subjectivity and theory choice, uh, the discussion uh, that Kuhn brings up. Uh, and the last is away from determinism and indeterminism. So I kind of blew through a lot of this, in part, I think, because me standing up here and talking about it is not the most effective thing. I, part of the reason that I wrote this down is that I think it's better to read a careful exposition of it than to get the thoughts off the top of my head. But more importantly, what you really need to do is wrestle with the stuff. So just reading what I think isn't going to get you very far. Um, what I really want you to do is, is pick up the book and do some of the exercises. And as I'll talk about in a minute, I want to get you to, to write a case study. Um, but just to finish off a couple of thoughts here, I hope you'll read the book. Uh, I think the complexity science stuff might be fun for you. And I think parts of it are probably familiar to each of, it, each of you, but it's unlikely that all of you are familiar with all of it. So there might be some good stuff there. Uh, the philosophy of science might be new to you, unless that's a hobby of yours. The analysis of algorithms stuff is probably not that new to many of you, at least the software engineers. Uh, and similarly, uh, intermediate Python, those are two topics that, that suited my class that may or may not be the most important things to you. All right, the case studies. So I mentioned that the students worked on case studies, and then we picked the best ones, and then we published them. We're planning to do the same thing with the next edition of the book. So if you're familiar with the cookbook um, books that O'Reilly does, so if the Python cookbook, for example, they collected a bunch of short articles where someone would explain a recurring problem and give a solution to it and explain the alternatives. They published a bunch of them. And then there's a web page that collects submissions. And then every once in a while, they, they seem to collect all the good ones off the web page. And that becomes the next edition of the book. <coughs> so we're thinking about something similar. Just because there's so much good stuff here, and I didn't want to and couldn't cram it all into the book, um, so I left some for my students, and they've left some for you. Some of the ones that they've done so far, uh, this is an ant trail model, uh, which is another agent-based model. We have a very simple model of, of um, ant behavior. Their decisions about whether they will turn left or right, and how they propagate <coughs> out from the nest. The interesting thing about that model is that a very simple system reproduces trails that are at least qualitatively similar to actual ant trails. But maybe more interestingly, different species of ants have different foraging patterns. And if you track them and look at the shape of those trails, they have distinctive texture to them. You could look at them and, and visually identify what species it was by the structure <coughs> of those trails. This model has a few parameters that you can turn that will make the trails look like species one or species two or species three, depending on how you tweak it. Um, so it's a nice model. Slime molds are another classic um, uh, agent-based model where the emergent behavior of the system is different in character from the behavior of the individual agents and surprising. And the surprisingness might be an important characteristic of emergent properties. Uh, another student project looked at uh, distribution of wealth. Uh, it's common observation that in a lot of economic systems, the distribution of wealth quickly becomes long-tailed. That seems to be hard to avoid and hard to fix. The system tends to gravitate toward those long-tailed distributions. And you might wonder why. Sugarscape is 
again, a very abstract, very not realistic model of an economy of a kind, a sugar economy, um, but it develops long tail distributions in ways that I, th I think can be explanatory. Uh, a knot in Wikipedia, if you have a directed graph and you follow links through the graph, you might find that you've arrived in a neighborhood that you can no longer get out of. Uh, and so the students were searching to see whether the, direct, the direct, directed graph created by Wikipedia uh, has knots in it. Uh, Norm's game is related to iterated prisoner's dilemma. Um, and then I had one student that took on a very ambitious project that didn't quite get to the finish line. So it's not in the book, but they did a lot of very cool stuff with the uh, evolution of virtual creatures. So the creatures would have a genotype that would describe their phenotype in a simulated three-dimensional environment. And so you would evolve them over time by having them interact in this simulated 3D world, have some kind of fitness contest to see who gets to be represented in the next generation, and then follow the gene pool over time. What they discovered, and lots of people have built versions of this, is that the animals discover lots of innovative solutions to problems like gathering food and hitting each other and, lo and locomotion and things like that, including the ability to exploit bugs in your simulation of the 3D world. <laughs> so, they discover magic. that's right, they discover <laughs> magic. One of, the things, one of the things that they discovered was that there was a, a error in the boundary condition that if you were, if your critter was very close to the boundary and kind of moving back and forth across the boundary of the world, it would start translating along one of the axes much faster than anything else in the world could move. And they kind of discovered the transporter and animals were, yeah. animals were exploiting it. And when they were running away from something, they would head for the boundary and then zip along. <laughs> okay, um, just a couple of thoughts about things I'm currently working on. Uh, in seven days, I need to turn in the manuscript of Think Python, and they're going to try to turn it around and make it available by July. So we'll see how all that goes. This is the second draft of the cover. I have to tell you a little bit about the story of the cover. You might know that O'Reilly puts animals on all the covers, and a lot of people have wondered, well, who gets to choose the animals? They actually have a person who works full time. That's her job. She picks the animals. <laughs> and they tell you, if you're an author, they tell you very explicitly, don't try to pick your animal. We, we don't want to hear it. The most input that you get is that if you can give a few words that describe the character of your book, that will help the animal chooser <laughs> choose your animal. Uh, although for my books so far, they haven't even asked me for adjectives. They've just given me an animal. Now, I've been happy so far. I got an archer fish on the statistics book, which is a really cool, I don't know if you know about the archer fish, but it has a little groove in its throat and it shoots a jet of water out of the water and it hits insects. And so if an insect is out on a branch, it'll shoot this jet of water, knock it off the branch into the water, and then the archer fish swims over and eats it. And it turns out that it can shoot out of the water and hit things about two meters away with high accuracy, sort of you know, insect size precision, despite the fact that its, its eyes are underwater and it's going out into air, so it's got the refraction at the surface of the water that throws out. So it compensates for refraction and hits things. So cool animal, really happy with that. This is, I believe, a black eagle. Now I forget. It's on the last page of the book if you want to look it up. So OK, it doesn't shoot water or anything, but it, it, <laughs> it's cool enough. The Python book. The first draft of the cover came back with, all together now, a python. a python. Just like almost every other Python book, with a couple of exceptions. So I wrote back and I said, the Python's fine, and if you want to go with that, no problem. But Python, the programming language, is named after Monty Python. It's not named after the snake. So every time someone puts a Python on the cover of a Python book, you're basically <laughs> saying, we didn't get the joke. <laughs> so, so here's a suggestion. Can we put a dead parrot on the cover? <laughs> a Norwegian blue. A Norwegian blue. Exactly right. So, and the only thing I had to say was, 
the, the text at the end of the book that describes the animal that's on the cover. I said, look, if you'll please put a parrot on the cover, you could have a lot of fun with the text at the end because you could basically lift lines out of the sketch. It's the Norwegian blue. Beautiful plumage, isn't it? <laughs> that, that kind of thing. Um, so they, they went along with it. I believe this is not actually a Norwegian blue parrot because there's no such thing. <laughs> but as far as I'm concerned, that's a Norwegian blue parrot. <laughs> uh, I, haven't yet, I haven't seen the text that they've written yet, but I'm gonna try to convince them to actually say it's a Norwegian blue parrot and see if people get it. Uh, pr projects that are up next. Uh, is anybody familiar with the Little Book of Semaphores? I don't know if that's crossed anybody's path. Uh, I've, I wrote a book a number of years ago where I took all of the fun synchronization puzzles, um, like, uh, well, readers, writers, but also the Santa Claus problem, dining philosophers. What are the other fun ones? There's dining savages. If you took an operating systems class, you might have done one of these. Um, the bank curve? The which one? The bank curve. Uh, oh, yeah, no, that's the deadlock one, right? Yeah, yeah no, um, that, I didn't do a lot with deadlock, but anyway, I collected a bunch of synchronization puzzles, and uh, I'm gonna, thinking about turning that into a, a book called Think Sync, and I'm also thinking about linear algebra. Um, so there might be a Think Linear at some point. Uh, if you want to follow the prog progress, <clears throat> Green Tea Press is me. Green Tea Press is where I publish the first drafts of all my books <clears throat> and then see if I can find a publisher that, that wants to work with them. But while I'm developing them, they're all available under free licenses. Uh, for a while I was using the GNU free documentation license. Lately I've been using a lot of the Creative Commons licenses. But the nice thing is that you can modify these books, you can translate them into other languages, you can pull chapters out of several different books and, and recombine them. Um, so there are a lot of cool projects that I think come from making material available like that. The Python book that is the origin of the statistics book and the complexity book was originally a Java book that somebody else translated from Java into Python and sent it back to me. And I actually learned Python by reading my own book. <laughs> Which was very strange. <laughs> because I recognized my writing, but it was telling me things I didn't know. <laughs> and it's kind of like those time travel plots where you from the future comes and tells you things. That's exactly, so I've had that experience. Um, so yes, check out the free books. Uh, read Think Complexity, write a case study. I think that's all I wanted to talk about for now, but I'm happy to take questions or hear comments or our questions at, uh, to interview two candidates at Google often go around, you know, algorithms and complexity and data structure. Do you have mm -hmm. good questions? Because most of them are banned now. Right. <laughs> I'll have to think about that. Because, I mean, this, we're, we're taking a kind of different approach to it. And that might actually lend itself to, you know, what's the next generation of good algorithm design questions? Because it, it used to be kind of a test of the canon. There, you know, how much of Corman, Lyserson, and Rivest have you absorbed and can deliver on request? You know, usually applied in non-trivial ways. So I mean, the thing I like about the questions is a lot of you know, what you learn from memorizing a data structures book, you might not be able to apply in flexible ways to a new problem. And I think that's what a lot of interview questions are really testing. So I think that's the good part. But, I'm, kind of, I'm getting away from this canonical idea that you have to know three kinds of leveling, you know, uh, balance and self-balance trees, or that you have to know, you know five implementations of a queue and all the pros and cons of them. Um, but That's because we design by search now. Because we design by search, yeah. So I mean, I, but I think there is a different toolkit now and a different set of knowledge. I think there are a number of sufficiently solved problems that we kind of don't really need to think much about their implementation, or at least a very small number of people will. The vast majority of us will now work above that level of, of abstraction. So let's put some of that stuff aside and now think about what are the interesting and hard questions now at that level. Um, but I don't have any great ones off the top of my head, but I love the question. Yeah? You talked about uh, moving from the uh, predictive to the explanatory, mm. um, but we still 
need predictions, sure. even in the complex worlds in which we're learning new things. By saying science is moving from here to there, I take it you're saying that we're, we're able, if we move over here, to discover more new things per decade than if we just stayed where we were, where we kind of mined what we can get from the same kinds of things that gave us celestial mechanics. Yes. Yeah. And, but we still need, yes. so to a certain extent, you're giving us a model of science. You're saying we are likely to get more discoveries per decade if we move over here. Mm -hmm. um, but we need a prediction about how many more. For example, if I had one of these scale-free networks, perhaps a, the biggest social network in the world, <laughs> is that worth $100 billion or $90 billion? <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, so yes, we still need models that are capable of prediction. I think the, what, when I'm describing that shift, I think two things are going on. One of them is that we are relaxing the requirement that every model, model be predictive and admitting that there can be good science at the other end of the spectrum. That it, you, there's lots of good work to be done there even if we relax the requirement to be predictive. Um, and the other is that we can be a little bit more fearless about attacking large, complex, heterogeneous systems that I think for a long time we would have avoided because we knew we wouldn't be able to make any progress on them with the tools that we had. Now with a different set of tools, we can start to attack a bigger set of problems. Yeah. I had a question about um, the trend towards instrumentalism. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about that an electron exists. I was kind of reminded of like the Zeno school of paradoxes. One of the paradoxes was the millet paradox, right? Why does why does a bag of millet when dropped make a sound when a single pellet of millet when dropped does not make a sound? You know, I, I think this talked both to their ideas of summation and their use of perception as a means of determining reality. Mm -hmm. Right, so the Greeks said, well, the sound doesn't exist unless my ear can actually hear it. Mm -hmm. Right, an electron, in my understanding, is it's real in the sense of you, you can prove that, what is it, Thompson's experiment, the thing about the droplets moving at discrete velocities, right, that there's a quantized charge. And so one can assign quantification to that. Like, are we moving towards a trend of other things being considered like reified, like a traffic jam or, or some sort of complex phenomenon as real, you know, in, in, as part of your paradigm shift? Right, okay. So I think, so the Zeno example is one of those cases where the two endpoints are clear and some, but something that must change in the middle, but we have a really hard time saying where it changed in the middle. And I think realism and instrumentalism has that character as well. There are some examples where the vast majority of us feel entirely comfortable saying, yep, that's real. At the other end of the spectrum, things that we're all at least have a consensus that they're not. Something in the middle, there has to be a transition somewhere in the middle. Where do we put it? Um, one way to resolve that is to say, is to just accept as real any entity postulated by a theory that we use. So if it's a good theory, then the entities that it postulates are real. In other words, you just expand the space of what you're willing to call real to make the conflict go away. The other is to go all the way to instrumentalism and say that all of our theories are tools that we use to explain stuff and we're not obligated to consider any of our hypostulated entities as real. Even things that seem really obviously real, like nice firm objects, which at the meso scale of physics have nice reality to them, but if you go to very small scales, that starts to get fuzzy. Now, with nice solid objects, I think we have a hard time with it. One of the examples I like to use is mushrooms. When you look at a mushroom, what you're actually looking at is this fruiting body of a fungus. And that thing that's discrete that we pick up and eat seems to have nice realness to it. But that organism that you just harvested is actually a very fine network of cells that's mostly underground. The underground part might be hundreds or thousands or millions of times more massive than the thing that you just picked up. So in the sense of being big and concrete, it's real, but it's also really diffuse. It doesn't have borders that you could track. You couldn't dig it up. You would end up digging up an acre of land. 
and you couldn't separate it from the soil that it's part of. So it, it has some of the characteristics that we associate with nice, concrete, well-delineated objects, but not all of them. That's one of those weird little middle test cases that I like to think about. One of the other ones that's a little bit fun is trying to figure out which atoms do you consider to be you? <laughs> okay. Now, one of them is, you know, if you weigh yourself, you get the total mass of the stuff that you consider to be you. But that includes, you know, cells that have your DNA. Those seem like they're probably you. But it also includes lots of dead stuff. That may or may not be you. It includes lots of other organisms like the bacteria that live in your gut and the mites that live in your eyebrows and all kinds of other things that, again, you know, so are you a symbiotic colony of all of those things? You could have a lot of fun with this. Sorry if I'm wandering around a little bit. Yes. We have time for, we have time for one more question if anyone has one. Great. Yes. Um, one thing, this is going to be a vague wandering question. One thing really I will give you a vague uh, wandering answer. Interests <laughs> me is um, uh, the problems that human brains seem to have dealing with complexity. One of the manifestations of that is that very smart people make very stupid mistakes. Um, NASA has been pretty good at that with centimeters <laughs> versus inches and things crashing. And Mm -hmm. um, and then the sort of recurrence of the number 150, which sort of the size of a village mm -hmm. and the number yeah. of social connections, are, are there, do you, do you think there are limitations to our, our physical limitations maybe even to our mm -hmm. brain in, in dealing with increasing complexity? And are there ways out of that dilemma? Right. Um, it does seem clear that there are aspects of human psychology that influence what we consider to be good theories and bad theories and also our decisions about things like real and not real and all that. And that does seem to be a consequence of, of the environment our brains evolved in. Um, and it, com it comes with a certain set of capabilities, the things that we're really good at, and also, as you said, certain kinds of lapses where things like engineering systems tend to poke at exactly the spots in our brains that are kind of soft. Um, so I promised a vague and wandering answer. I think that might have been it. Um, <laughs> so I think that, well, the challenge then for theory choice is to distinguish between what are the preferences that we have just because that's how we are versus preferences that we can justify in terms of properties like being truth tropic. You know, I think that this is uh, more likely to lead toward more truth. You know, I think this theory is better than that one, not just because my monkey brain tells me that it's better, but because I've got a justified reason to believe that it's more likely to lead, to, lead toward a truth, be good for prediction, whatever the other characteristics are that we have for a model. All right. Great. Thank, Thank you all very much. much.